Judge Joe Brown's all new barbecue sauce and seasoning, justice in the form of flavor. Law firms will take this as a retainer. What? It must be a law firm when they hungry as hell. Now you gonna help me with this parole I'm dealing with? Judge Joe Brown's all new barbecue sauce and seasoning, justice in the form of flavor. With one taste of our premium blends of all natural ingredients, herbs, and spices, mm, you'll fall in love with meat all over again. Judge Joe Brown's all natural barbecue sauce collection is made up of two zesty flavors, original and spicy. There's only one way to bring order back to barbecuing. Just add Judge Joe Brown's all natural barbecue sauce and seasoning and you be the judge. All of the above, and it's what we had that backs up the six-member majority of the Supreme Court is just what you're talking about. We're drifting into the methods of fascism, and what we have here with the very able decision by the majority of six on the current Supreme Court with this immunity thing today was very sound. Um, it's restorative of confidence because it looks like the type of decision that you got uh, back in the late 50s, 60s, and early 70s with Justice Black, Justice Douglas, uh, uh, Earl Warren, Chief Justice. In other words, it's good, solid law rather than what I call crank law. I was rather disgusted by reading the three minority opinions, which I thought were pretty weak. Yeah. Well we're gonna we're gonna get into all that. Um we're gonna um I have it laid out. We're not going is we're not gonna go through 119 pages. Um mm -hmm. but well, um, I did but that's what I do did for a living. Now, when I tell you sometimes when, like you asked the other day, why is it taking so long? What did I tell you? It's like writing a term paper. So all of these decisions that they've issued, you have these many pages. And in this case, it was 119 pages. That takes a while. There are only nine of them. They do have law clerks, but essentially all of these cases that they write opinions on stand is the law of the land the mm -hmm. interpretation of the supreme law of the land they're supposed to provide guidance for attorneys and lower courts and they take research they have to go through all of these cases analyze them write them up and it takes a while you just can't do it overnight right um so let me just do a quick background um, and then I'll have you break it down. So justices rule Trump has some immunity from prosecution that came out today. And I like this. this he has absolute immunity for anything that's associated with his official duties. Right. What does that mean? I will give you an easy translation. If it came from the white house while he was at his desk, it's official unless it was something like, Hey, um, uh, I've got a new, that new suit you're making for me. Make sure you only have two buttons on it, not three, like I usually order. That's not official, mm -hmm. but it's pretty hard to say it was not official if it concerned the business of the government. And in this case, something that also has to do a lot with January 6 comes into play. Uh, Trump was not trying to get Pence to disobey the law. He was trying to get him to follow it because the next thing on the congressional agenda, they got tabled due to the one six disturbance by Nancy Pelosi was a consideration of the impact of what is popularly known as the confidence in elections act of 1877. Yeah. 135, 40 years old. And what that says is any time there is widespread lack of confidence in the outcome of the electoral process, the vice president shall not certify the electoral college count that is offered to Congress, but shall instead call for the appointment of a 15 member committee composed of five from the House, five from the Senate, 
and five from the U.S. Supreme Court. Said committee shall take a minimum of 10 days to conduct an independent audit of the election results or such other uh, additional time as is necessary. So the so-called calls that were extra administrative are all related to his official functions. Find me some votes becomes a maybe a lack of imp, maybe imprecision in language, but one of the clear meanings is something seems wrong. Go find out if it is. And now we find out three and a half years afterwards that in fact, even in Georgia, where he was indicted supposedly for improprieties under state law, which is what it is, we find that the state agencies have made determinations that in fact there were electoral improprieties and all across the country we're discovering that once the investigative mechanisms of government and the court started becoming involved, there were and are discrepancies that should have been looked into under the 1877 Act, but they weren't. All right. And got a lot to do with the ineffective press that has become a propaganda engine in the fashion I was elaborating upon a little earlier. Well, I want to just um, read a little bit of this um, summary of this article. And I like this website, scotusblog.com, because it's, it's firsthand from the Supreme Court. Um, and so what we're going to do tonight, you are, you're going to be the professor. You're going to be a professor tonight and we we're all going to be the students. Um, I, I'm not going to go through the 119 pages. I, I just do have certain pages that I'm just going to bring up and have you comment on. Um, I do want us to talk about the Federalist Papers in Hamilton and Madison, what we spoke about earlier. And then we got to talk about AOC. She's batshit crazy. But all right. Um, let me read this real quick. So it says historical decision. Divided Supreme Court on Monday ruled that former president can never be prosecuted for actions relating to the core powers of their office and that there is at least a presumption that they have immunity for their official acts more broadly, which you just explained. So what does that mean, right? Um, it said the decision left open a possibility that the charges brought against President Donald Trump by special counsel Jack Smith, alleging that Trump conspired to overturn the results of the 2020 election, can still go forward to the extent that the charges are based on his private conduct rather than his official. So basically, does Jack Smith even have a case? <laughs> no, he doesn't. And also, the big gorilla. 2,000 pound prehistoric gorilla that's in the core in the room is this. The Bill of Rights was specifically crafted. You can read about it in the Federalist Papers if you want to go through the long things for the specific purpose of preventing the use of criminal prosecutions for political purposes. Mm -hmm. now, and it it, it says the case now returns to the lower courts for them to determine for them to determine whether the conduct at the center of the charges against Trump was official or unofficial. And, and then the Supreme Court will look at their determinations to make a, a, an assessment of whether or not they were valid determinations. So, in other words, one step at a time. But they jumped in on this because. It was so egregiously bad what was going on. And we have so many judges and lawyers now that I don't think are really qualified to be in the level of cases they are involved in because of their lack of experience. Now, you just read something that I disagree with totally. It wasn't a split decision. A 6-3 decision is not looked at as a split. It's decision. a divided. Not a divided one okay. either. It's not a divided. It's a majority. No. A 5-4 decision is a divided court. Right. A 6-3 is not. What is 6-3? That's a majority? 
that is a majority. Yeah, five four is a majority. That's why we have nine, which isn't fixed by constitution, by the way. So you can change it. But but the article she put divided, but it, divided. It's not divided when it's six three. Mm -hmm. It is divided when it's five four, mm -hmm. almost half and half. But right. one person flips over. Six three is not divided. So that's inappropriate language. Right. All right. Um, um, do I owe you an apology? About what? When I used to always rush you. Yeah. Honey, and I sent you this, and you probably read all the hundred. I read the whole thing, yeah. yeah. We're not doing that. And I didn't want to, and then if you read the, if you, if you type in this immunity case, you're going to have all these left articles with the title, um, Supreme court rules for communism for dictatorship. Right. So, and it's not that. So I think they rule squarely on the side of a democratic Republic and returning things to normal from where they were going. I keep telling people that what we are seeing is the beginning of a fascist government if something isn't done to stop it. I am frankly disgusted with the opinion of the three dissenting justices. Mm -hmm. It is just deplorable. It's mm -hmm. like, where did they come from? Mm -hmm. um and also the exercise of decorum. One of them, Sotomayor, uh, gave her a little recitation when she read her complete decision from the bench. And it was an emotive one. And motions do not need to be in the law. It needs to be detached. But she and the other two that went along with her in a lot of their activities keep trying to interject emotionalism. I cried with despair when I read what they've done. I cried. I don't know what a woman is. Yeah, but you are not in the position. You're not exercising a function where that is appropriate. You're supposed to be cold and analytical about it remote and detached. Some of the women on the Supreme Court act that way and certain other ones are full of their emotions and they let everybody know it. And it's inappropriate because this kind of thing just has not been done. A court speaks through its orders. A judge speaks through his or her orders. So you should be clear and analytical what you say and put in writing so there is guidance for others so that they can confirm their conduct to the requirements of the law. See, in America, unlike what the ignorant push, all law in America is essentially judge-made law until it's superseded by something a legislative body does. The very first case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1790s said all law in the United States is the common law until superseded by statutory law. What is the common law? Quote, the common law is that body of judge made law based on tradition, precedent and the evolving conditions of society. And they cited with uh, approval a 1661 case heard by the English House of Lords where they said that, and that was 134 years before, 133 years before, and it said, all law in England is the common law. The common law is that body of judge made law based on tradition, precedent, and the evolving conditions of society. So it was a repeat of a 130-year-old decision. Mm -hmm. So this um, opinion, right, it says Donald Trump petitioner versus United States. And it, it is kind of fascinating, right? Because you, you read the summary. Um, oh, no, wait, let me go to the beginning. Yeah. May I just make one further interjection? Yeah. 
you get on me for not being brief, but as you see in this opinion, in order to be persuasive, sometimes you can't be. And essentially, if I can break it down to the elements, it's you have to apply a thousand years worth of law, 2000 years worth of law, developing principles and some peculiar things about the very nature of your country's law and purposes and bring them all in. And you have to be able to show your chain of logic, why, wherefore, and what you're doing so other people will understand what you're trying to do or what you just did if you have the ultimate authority. So I'm fascinated with this because syllabus they have a syllabus yeah and the syllabus 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 it's like a bunch of pages isn't it right before you get to the first opinion yeah it's a lot isn't it 119 pages worth of stuff that's a book and then it gets to opinion of the court right Mm -hmm. And then, uh, this is Chief Justice Roberts delivered um, opinion of the court. What page did I say I wanted to go to? Um, nine. Um, okay, yeah, this is nine. So Chief Justice Roberts delivered opinion to court. This case concerns the federal indictment of former President of the United States for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office. We consider the scope of the president's immunity from criminal prosecution. Before he issues his opinion, he actually writes out the case that was brought. Yeah, you have to have a when you have write an appeal, and you have a brief, and in the opinion, you have to have a recitation of the facts of the case as they are deemed to be and what the opinion uh -huh. is based on. Now, the first thing he says is. Oh. What's the hear. oh wow, I can hear you. Hi, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. The answer and the foundation for everything that follows in his opinion is already given to you. It's an indictment for allegedly official acts of then President Trump official acts. Now, the decision is there is immunity for official acts. So you can't get outside of the accusation. If the accusation that somebody is standing in jeopardy of is for official acts, then they are limited to proving official acts. And it's already been held by the highest court in the land as of today by a 6-3 opinion, not divided court, a solid majority of the court, that official acts are immune. So going through this, you can hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Going through this opinion, they cite a lot of cases and I, I pull this up because you always, I've heard you say th uh, um, dozens of times, Marbury versus Madison. And Justin Chief Roberts cited Marbury versus Madison in his opinion. One of the most famous cases in American history. The court distinguished between two kinds of official acts, discretionary and men mental trial. What? Ministerial. Ministerial. Thanks. In other words, discretionary means you don't have to do it. It's on your own initiative. Ministerial means it just comes through as part of routine business. It observes that, yeah, although discretionary acts are only politically examinable, the judiciary has the power to hear cases involving, how you pronounce that? Min Ministerial. Ministerial trial. Ministerial, like you're ministerial. a minister. 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 Oh, ministerial. Minister. Ministerial. In other words, this is your job. Who signs off on this particular request going out to the army? 
who okays the promotion of the generals recommended, who issues the order on such and such. That's ministerial, the routine stuff. In other words, uh, who is going to be assigned to what the president signs off? Uh, ministerial. Are we going to invite the French ambassador over day after tomorrow for this conference? He signs off on that. That's ministerial. Okay. So this is from Marbury versus Madison. You always cite this, especially when it comes to freedom of press, right? No, that's not freedom of press. I'll no, tell you, what, you. Let me tell you what Marbury versus Madison was about. Congress gave the president authority to appoint stuff like postmasters and things like that. So Marbury was appointed by the preceding president, Jefferson, to a position as postmaster general for an area. Uh, Jefferson signed the uh, approval into law the last night he was in the White House. Okay. President Madison refused to honor it and said, hell no, I'm not going to do that. So Marbury sued President Madison. So he got his appointment to get his appointment as postmaster. All right. Madison said the act was unconstitutional and the Supreme Court agreed with him. And it set a precedent under American law where the Supreme Court of the United States or other appellate courts dealing with uh, legislative action on their level can declare those actions unconstitutional. So that set forth the American principle that courts can declare acts of Congress to be unconstitutional. So that's what Marbury versus Madison is about. Marbury, Mr. Marbury did not get his appointment as postmaster general because Madison refused to honor Jefferson's appointment. Interesting. I love that. I like because I like I like history, especially if somebody is making now, it interesting. You want to get the politics involved? Very simply, with this, mm -hmm. uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Marshall, said, "This is a chance for us to establish it." President Madison wouldn't dare disagree with what we come up with because it gets him what's it, what he wants, which is not having to appoint all of these Jeffersonian appointments who he wants to ignore so he can use the patronage for his own people. So mm -hmm. Madison went along with the Supreme Court. That became the binding precedent for the rest of the history of the United States of America in the 223, 21 years since. It was in 1803. Marbury, M-A-R-Berry versus Madison. So they also cited Youngstown Sheep and Two Company versus Sawyer. I saw that a couple of times in this opinion. Um, I wanted to go down to this one. Um, it says they disagree, however, about whether former President Trump can be prosecuted for his official actions. Trump contends that just as president is absolutely immune from civil damages liability for acts within the outer perimeter of his official responsibility, he must be absolutely immune from criminal prosecution for such acts. Brief for petitioner and Trump argues that the bulk of the indictment allegations involve conduct in his official capacity as um, president. Was that mm -hmm. the one I wanted to highlight? Yeah, that's important. A lot of people don't understand what the difference is or what the distinction is. Between? Is it dealing with a matter or a subject, a situation or a circumstance that is something to be dealt with by the president. What is the president? The president is the chief executive order officer of the United States. He's commander in chief of the armed services and he's the chief diplomat under the constitution for the United States. So if it deals with diplomacy and instructions, orders, negations, countermands or whatever it may be dealing with diplomacy and international relations, 
if he issues it, it's within his official line of duties. If it's got to do with law enforcement or enforcing the law, then it is official. And you see, here's the other thing. Mm -hmm. When the Constitution was adopted, nobody wanted to have Monday morning quarterbacking that we call right now. In other words, armchair generals, armchair evaluators who after the fact want to go back and say he should have decided it this way and they did not want anybody criminalized for making a bad decision. Mm -hmm. It was only when the decision was not his to make now, the president has his First Amendment rights as a citizen. He also has rights as the chief law enforcement officer for the United States of America to ensure that American law is followed. So complaining about making an observation of or issuing instructions or orders dealing with carrying out his authority as chief law enforcement officer for the United States, he's immune to that. Now, if you want to understand it, a whole lot of people who go to trial are not convicted. Less than 2%, a little more than 2% of the people in penitentiaries were convicted by a jury. So most jury trials do not result in a conviction. 97 plus percent of all the people in the penitentiaries in America for the last 50 years have entered pleas of guilty and depending upon what decade it's in, 84 to 87 percent have confessed. Sometimes those confessions are questionable, mm -hmm. but for the most part, the system does work as intended and a lot of people complaining about being victimized by the system are in their positions because they made it easy for the system to take advantage of their circumstances. But there are a significant number of people who are wrongfully committed and a longstanding principle of American law, a longstanding one that if you ask most of the day's lawyers and judges about, they've never heard. That's tradition. Quote, it is better for 100 guilty men to go free than for one innocent man to be convicted, unquote. Mm. And that's a standing principle of American law. So um, here it says T -t 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 -t, United States versus Burr. Um, oh, this is the one I'm going to go to. Similarly. Old huh? It's old case. What, Burr? United States versus Burr? What day? What year is it? Uh, It gives you the year here? Yeah, it should. Oh, 1807. Damn. <laughs> it's a whole case. They cite the age that gives it the weight of long authority. This is not new stuff. The government has been in existence 200 and... 17 years since this decision was issued. So it's ancient law for the United States. United States versus Burr, Virginia, 1807, stating that nothing before the court showed that the document in question contained any matter, the disclosure of which would endanger the public safety. And he noted that a court may not be required to proceed against the president as against an ordinary individual. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, similarly, when a subpoena issued to President Nixon to produce certain tape recordings and documents relating to his conversation with aides and advisors, this court rejected his claim of absolute privilege given the constitutional duty of the judicial branch to do justice in criminal prosecution, United States versus Nixon, 1974. Yeah, but you see, he couldn't claim it was classified. He couldn't claim the immunity that would come from uh, national secrets or that kind of thing. Effectively, what they were doing is committing the clear criminal act of burglarizing an office mm -hmm. and planning a listening device. 
Now, here's the other thing where it gets the gray area for presidential immunity. A lot of what the CIA does, a lot of what NSA, National Security Administration, does, a lot of what SEAL teams do when they, you know, come in by a submarine and they get into rubber boats or they parachute in halo high altitude, low opening, drop in at 35,000 feet, glide for 15 miles and pop the parachute at 1,500, and they take somebody out. A lot of those are acts that are illegal under American law. But the president, in the name of American security, orders them carried out. But they do not result in, after the fact, five years, ten years later, the president being prosecuted for violating the law. An example, and I won't belabor this one, is Barack Obama was president when a citizen... I'm bringing that up. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, it illustrates the immunity thing. Barack Obama was president of the United States when it developed that a citizen of the United States who was a Detroit resident sued him to get an injunction against his order that his son be assassinated. The son was born in the United States and in Detroit, and the gentleman not only feared for his son's life, but for his grandson's life. So grandson was 16, also born in Detroit, Michigan, full-fledged American citizen. And what happened is the federal district court enjoined the Obama administration from assassinating this guy. The government agreed that it was clear that the son, let alone the minor grandson, had broken no laws against the United States or any state in the United States. It was just their exercise of free speech privileges under the First Amendment the Obama administration found dangerous, so they decided extra constitutionally that they were going to execute the man. The judge made the remark on the record. He said, well, what about this? Uh, Doesn't the Constitution and the Bill of Rights declare that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law? Of course, the government agreed to that proposition of the court. The court said, well, how then does he order somebody be deprived of their life without due process of law? So the Justice Department that was representing Obama said, well, it comes from an authority beyond the Constitution. The judge exhibited incredulity like, what in the world is that? And then the other thing is, he was saying, the judge made this specific comment in the transcript. He said, so in other words, gentlemen, the government's position is that if some American citizen unwittingly takes a vacation outside of the country or travels outside of the country, he can be assassinated. The government paused, it was said a pause in the transcript. They said, not quite, Your Honor. And the court said, the court is relieved. Said, well, Your Honor, actually, it doesn't have to be outside the continental U.S. So the judge says, wait a minute. You're contending that the president can order a man assassinated inside the United States? And the representatives for the government said, well, yes, Your Honor, that's our position. So the judge said, what happens if some local cops intervene and one of them is killed in the process? So the government's position, well, the president can pardon them. So that will be the end of the matter if they're carrying out his orders. So the judge said, well, who pardons the president for depriving this man of life without due process of law? He said, the court's issuing this injunction and we'll give the government 60 days for further reply. So after about 40 days, Obama had the man assassinated by drone, and four and a half hours later, his 16-year-old son was assassinated by drone. So On American soil or no? No. No, it wasn't. But their position was it was okay if it was on American soil. So the point was, here's an injunction by a court against the president, and the Constitution clearly says 
the president is obligated to obey such orders of federal courts as are dispositive of certain things. So he disobeyed a direct injunction by the federal courts who had clear jurisdiction that he not assassinate an American citizen and the son of the American citizen who was also an American citizen without due process of law, but he did it anyway, and he has not been prosecuted. So the claim was he was immune, but you see, you have to deal with that as a matter of history, but you will not find that in Google. You have to have actually had access to the transcript of the trial proceedings or the hearings before the federal district court to learn that. Um. Basically, Obama, he was he was pretty evil. Yeah, well, his daddy ran counterintelligence and did assassinations for the CIA. Lolo Sotoro ran the spy agency operations for the U.S. government in North Korea, North Vietnam, the People's Republic of China, Cambodia, and Laos while the Vietnam War was going on. Mm -hmm. 